growth and industrial uh, strategy for the government. Uh, my name is Andrew Whitty. I'm the uh, chief executive of GlaxoSmithKline in my day job, and uh, in the evenings, I'm lead non-executive director for the Department of Biz. Um, I thought what we might do over the next 30 minutes or so is I'll just take a few, literally just a few minutes, just to uh, briefly introduce the idea and what's going on, at least from a policy uh, direction on industrial strategy, but then really uh, give you the chance to ask questions or uh, if there's, if there's uh, any controversy to debate uh, some of this uh, and give you some of that time. So you all know that since the election, growth has really been the priority for the government. There's been a lot of talk about growth, but interestingly, for the last 40 years, there's not really been a framework for growth in the UK. So there's been a lot of aspiration, but there hasn't really been a structure. That really dates back to the mid-1970s when there was a sense that picking the winners was a failed strategy populated with um, events uh, such as British Leyland and one or two other fairly high-profile uh, failures in terms of government intervention in industrial policy. And so as a consequence of that, for a very long period of time, we've had a series of governments who have essentially decided not to get engaged on a proactive basis in terms of shaping where policy intervention should go. It was more a case of creating an environment without focus on particular sectors. Since I think the election, there's been an increasing focus on really, really how can we make a difference in terms of growth progress here in the UK. As you know, the Prime Minister has asked all of the Secretaries of State to have a growth objective, whoever they are, whichever department they're in. And the Secretaries of State are accountable for coming back to Cabinet and to the Prime Minister to explain what their department's doing for growth. But within government, biz is regarded as the department for growth. And so there's a lot of focus within biz about what we can do more. And that really led to the development and discussion of an industrial strategy. As I've said, we haven't had one for 40 years. And in some ways, the development of an industrial strategy, whether you think the content's right or wrong, in itself is quite a landmark event to go from we don't want something to actually create it after such a long period of time. Industrial strategy is not designed to be the answer to everything. So very often people look at it and immediately say, well, my pet subject isn't in this strategy paper, or my pet industry, or you missed this industry. That's not the point of the industrial strategy. The industrial strategy is to identify a series of large industries, i.e. broad, high employment industries, where the country is already a, essentially a significant player, hopefully a leader, certainly competitive, and an industry which would benefit from having further support and synchronization of government engagement around policy development. It's not designed to be the grand economic plan which covers every single thing, telling us how many bicycles to make in July. It's designed much more to try and point a synchronization of policy development. Within it, it focuses on industries you'd expect. So for example, aeronautical, automotive, life sciences, focuses on construction as a particular enabling sector. And the idea of that strategy is really then to stimulate or catalyze a fairly active and dynamic set of interventions, uh, development of specific industrial policies for each of those sectors which start to address the needs of those sectors. What might they be? It may address things like strategic procurement for government. Many of these sectors have in common very significant um, supply relationships with government. Government is already a large supplier, but because of the capital investment program, will become a pivotal demand generator, is the market for many of these uh, departments, but has not historically strategically procured, has not used its procurement agenda to essentially drive the industrial development. If it worked, it worked, but it wasn't assertively planned. So that might be one example. A second example might be skills development, where we know, for example, certain industries need certain types of skills producing. To what extent are we leaving that to happen by accident versus actually investing to make sure the skills agenda is in place? export support, building export markets, ensuring UKTI and other mechanisms are in place to facilitate that kind of uh, process. Creating fundamental alignment across the TSB and where we choose to invest in a very macro sense in terms of our technology investments. And you've seen some of that develop in things like commitments to space technology, commitments to genomic technology in the last year or so in two different uh, sectors. So the idea is to basically say to the sector, look, government thinks you're important. Government thinks you can be a, a growth creator and a job creator over the next 20 years. We want to know what you need 
to help you succeed, and government will look to see how we can create a policy to align what we're doing to help you be more successful. But it doesn't just stop there, and I think many historical views of what industrial policy are does stop there, which essentially says industry asks for a favor and government either says yes or no. What we're trying to do here is have a slightly different relationship where yes, industry clarifies what it needs, but in return for the government engaging with them in a constructive sense, those industries should then step up and help the government deliver its own agenda. So if, for example, the government agenda is to create apprenticeships, then an industry which is the beneficiary of being a selected industrial sector ought to be signed up to apprenticeship programs, creating that capacity. If, for example, the government wants to prioritize reducing carbon footprint, then an industrial sector which has been the beneficiary of focus and priority from government ought to be stepping forward and helping to deliver the carbon footprint goals. And you could imagine on both sides of this equation, the kind of examples I've given you can be much longer and much more diverse, and they'll be different sector to sector. This was all basically developed about 18 months ago, uh, adopted by Cabinet, has been rolled out since. I'd say we are making good progress in terms of gradually getting the word out that things are changing, but there's no question this is a gradual phenomena of change. There's not some magic light bulb that's just going to come on and fix everything. Some of the sector strategies are already deployed. Life sciences was first, and by the end of this year, all of the sectors will have had their strategy deployed and agreed. What are the two or three things that are really essential to this? Number one, the industry needs to be able to create a receptor to engage with government. So industries which have great representative councils, Automotive Council, for example, the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industry and Life Sciences, those sorts of councils where the government has a single point of interaction to figure out what's needed is essential. Construction's a real challenge because there is no really coherent, strong binding group in the construction industry. Hard to get a single view. So one of the key things from the industrial side is to create an easy to plug into receptor for government to understand what's needed and to create that dialogue. Number two, government needs to be able to deliver joined up government. So there's absolutely no point engaging in this if the only department who's prepared to actually take it seriously is biz. Because clearly, in all of those industrial sectors, there will be other departments, in many cases two or three departments of state, who actually are far more important in terms of how to develop that industrial uh, opportunity than biz is. DEC is a classic example. Obviously, DEC is the absolute pivotal department as far as the energy industry is concerned. And therefore, it's crucial that there is a joined up government phenomena there. Thirdly, it's essential that this is a long-term commitment. There's absolutely no point engaging on the industrial strategy if it's up for review, cancellation, and reversal at every election. Industries evolve over very, very long cycle times, far in excess of political cycle times. And this type of activity is extremely vulnerable to short-term vacillation at a political level. So there are two or three really key ingredients. The evidence, or the goal, really, is to try and marshal a much more coordinated government industry effort to ensure that our industries with the best potential to be global leaders actually are global leaders, and we're able to continue to try and drive a rebalancing the, of the economy, government to private sector, but more importantly, domestic to international demand, to take advantage of the decline in strength of sterling and to actually start to drive a greater export opportunity in the country, which has not really materialized as quickly as it should have done when you look at the devaluation of the pound. That tells you that we haven't got this right yet. If we had a very finely tuned industrial platform, the devaluation of the pound should have led to a much more rapid increase in exports than it did, and it tells you we've got great work to do. That's obvious because we know that because there hasn't been an industrial strategy, there has been a drift to an over-dependence on the financial sector. And as a consequence, we've got quite a bit of work to do to change that. So that's very quickly the headline of what's going on. Some of you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute. Isn't job creation all about SMEs? And why hasn't he mentioned SMEs? Two points. One, obviously the SMEs are the pivotal element of all the supply chains of the big industries. So the industries are always 
characterized as being three or four major companies, but of course there are actually thousands of supply SMEs. GSK alone has 20,000 suppliers in the UK, or almost all of whom are SMEs. So by virtue of getting the head of the supply of the demand chain right, you essentially create pull-through opportunity for supply chain. But secondly, and more importantly, one of the things we're looking at and want to try and achieve in a development of the industrial strategy is to really explore in a much more detailed way what more government can do specifically to help SMEs be more successful as a sector in its own right. Now, that's a difficult, heterogeneous sector, but there are clearly common challenges faced by SMEs. One of the things I'm doing for Biz at the moment is leading a review of the role of universities and their potential role in leveraging economic growth. And it, you'll see in my recommendations of that review that there is a clear opportunity for universities and business schools to have a much greater capacity to lean into helping SMEs than they do today. So I think one of the things you'll see is as we go through the next year or so, a significant increase in focus on how to help SMEs. So not forgotten, but the initial phases were much more focused on the big uh, industrial sectors that already exist. I'll stop there. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, what's going on. Uh, and if you have questions or uh, points of clarification or, or argument you'd like to get into, uh, please, uh, I would look forward to hearing that. And it'd be helpful for me if you could just tell me where you're from. It'd be very useful. Yeah, please. Uh, my name's Charles Price. I'm Ch Charles Price from the Cabinet Office. One of the uh, questions I have, if you look at the UK, and this is actually specifically around science and research and development, is huge numbers of world-changing technologies have been researched and discovered in the UK. And over the last 50 years, they've been commercialised outside the UK. What, what do you think Biz and the government should be doing to, to try and retain the benefit of, of some of those technologies like LCD screens or ultrasound, MRI, all those, all those great things? Great question. So how do we keep stuff once we've discovered it? Um, I think we need to take a much more integrated view of the value chain. So there has been a historic, which again is a little bit a side effect of not having an industrial strategy. We've said, okay, great. We have lots of Nobel Prize winners. We have lots of universities. That's enough. It turns out all the jobs are further down the value chain than that. And you know, clearly you've seen great examples of that. One of the saddest things I ever did was have lunch with Peter Mansfield who, who invented the MRI system. And of course, it, it, all, it basically created a company called GE in America and uh, Britain really got no benefit from it despite the fact that we have the Nobel Prize. So um, I think the two or three things we have to be thoughtful about is rationally, how do inventors choose to locate jobs and one of the most important pieces of policy evolution in the last several years has been the patent box in the UK, which speaks directly to this question. If you look even at a company like GSK, we have huge amounts of research in Britain, but for the last 40 years, we've typically taken the drug discovery, we've created a product, and then often it's been made offshore, and then exported around the world. Because of the patent box, we're now incented to manufacture it here in Britain. And in fact, the way the incentive works is we're, in, we're, in, we're now incented to do more research here, more manufacture here, and therefore more export from here. And the only way we can get advantage from that incentive is to do all of that economic activity. I think the government needs to be much more thoughtful about how to influence economic activity. It, doesn't, it hasn't been sufficiently interventionist on that type of thing and has frankly been left a bit in the dirt by countries like Singapore, Ireland in particular, in t who are two who have been extraordinary at this, the US in a different way through all sorts of other incentives that are created for entrepreneurialism. So I think there is actually the beginnings of some real change. The patent box is a massive material change for any industry that's heavy IP and has discovery here in the UK because you would be kind of crazy to go make it somewhere else because you're giving up a tremendous opportunity. So that I think really starts. But as a government, I would encourage you to start thinking through the full value chain of where each of these, where, who makes the decision about where the economic activity is and how do you lock that down? Thanks. Helpful? Thanks, Charles. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm a new starter at the Treasury. Um, I was wondering if you could perhaps clarify, because you've gone into it a bit already, at what point and what, what were the signs that just sort of leaving, leaving industry to sort of get on with it, what were the main signs that made us think, actually, this isn't working very well, and we're not getting what we want from the, from the economy? And what, what, what was behind the thinking that said, this is the way we're going to improve it? So why did we stop leaving them to it, and why are we now 
taking this form of proactive action. Okay. So why now and what makes the difference? I mean, I think you could have had this conversation at any time in the last 35 years, actually. I think there's a, an interesting... Uh, uh, an interesting decision was taken in the 70s. We, you know, government gets its fingers burnt, so we're going to just leap out of the space completely. In my experience, being black or white on an issue is always a mistake. So either being deeply in or deeply out feels like the wrong response. But in fact, the government of all of all persuasions have done that. I think you look at that. You look where we are today. The government is 50% of the UK economy, right? More or less. You, government is, it's, it's disingenuous to pretend that the government isn't a massive signaling system. And if the government chooses not to signal, it doesn't mean there's no signal. It means the government's not interested, right? And it means that all of the potential levers which are at the disposal of government, like procurement, are being used in a way which is potentially being misinterpreted by UK companies or UK industry. So I think the real realization, and I, in a way, you needed the economic crisis to force it which is really, didn't we make a mistake in 1974 to jump out completely from this space? And we probably did as a country. And if you look at most of our competitors who've taken share from Britain, manufacturing share from Britain in the last 40 years, the big difference is they've been more interventionist than we have. I'm not suggesting and nobody's suggesting we should go to state planning, which is the kind of all in. It's a question of being half in rather than all out. And so our competitors have taken share. They are all characterized by this type of thing. The people who've won the manufacturing contracts for inventions in Britain have done it because they've got integrated attacks on those industries to really pick off the key bits of the value chain. And that's why it's moved. Um, and that's really the big change. And the economic crisis, I think, has just forced everybody to say, it's one thing to say we want grow. You know, the prime minister can stand up and say, we want to grow. Well, great. What's your transmission mechanism? Other than, tax, other than tax and monetary policy. And you, you know, we've had five years of proof that monetary policy doesn't make anything happen very quickly. So really trying to figure out how to create a transmission mechanism which allows the government to start to re-stimulate growth, particularly when you want to stimulate manufacture rather than finance. And I think that all has just come together. And I, it feel, I have to say, as an outsider to government, it does feel a bit like this is a... Everything has its time, and this sort of feels like it might be the right time. Stars might be aligned here. Does that help? Thanks. Yeah, please, at the back. I think you're going to have to come to the front, because this thing won't go that far. Thanks. Um, Susanna Brecknell from Civil Service World. Um, you spoke about this kind of planning being vulnerable to short-term uh, short political, political changes. How can civil service, um, without compromising impartiality and all those other things, how can they help to avoid that and protect this kind of thing from that risk? It's a great question. How do we stop this being disrupted by, you know, political cycles? I mean, the first thing is that, uh, you know, people like me and, and others who are involved in this need to, I mean, I think we need to be intensely apolitical, which also means we should be t talking about and, if you will, articulating the benefits of this to people of all political persuasion. So I think there is a quite an active piece of work to be done by those who are able to, to make sure that not just those in government, but those who could be in government really are aware of it. So I think that's quite an important role of all sorts of actors who are in this sort of space. Uh, secondly, I think civil service, who may not always be in such an easy, that might not be so easy. I think what's critical for civil service is you have to start thinking about your plans on a similar timeline to industrial plans. So don't just plan until between now and May 2015, but let's see what is a decade's plan for, for what you believe you can do in terms of helping this industry. Because I think to the extent to which you have got a strong belief and a point of view of what is the right thing to do in the long cycle time to support the industrial cycle, I think that creates a real point of reference for new, for new, new politicians to say, okay, A, these guys have actually thought this out and there's quite a good plan, and B, I need to kind of prove my idea is better than this idea. So you create a bit of tension in the system, whereas I think if you only synchronize your plan to the next election, it's kind of all up for grabs by definition. Companies, industries, investors want to see long-term predictability. And, and, and I can tell you, one of the great competitive advantages for the UK could be exactly this, because lots of other countries can't get this right. Why? Because the civil service is deeply politicized. So that when the politics change, the civil service in the US is a great example of that. 
you have a massive advantage in terms of having that continuity of civil service. What's really key is you have, you have great, uh, great plans, policy, strategy, which has a long enough horizon to bridge across. And I think that will create, make it much more difficult for people to take sharp left, sharp right turns. Yes, please. Annabelle McLeod, um, HMRC Cambridge Research and Development Pharmaceutical Unit. Um, if I can pick up on the first questioner very briefly, I think you'd find a 20-year, and, and I think it should be 20-year, cradle to grave um, financial analysis of the, the forces on the companies would tell you a great deal. Uh, but I'd like to say something out, outside really my immediate current area. I understand the, the benefits of focusing on the large businesses and so on. But I do wonder, I do wonder, I think if, if I was a, a small and medium sized enterprise business owner here, I would be sitting here saying, but hang on a minute, you're talking about these things, but there's all these barriers to my doing business. And, and, and really, what I'm wondering is, what are you moving towards to, to addressing those? Yeah. Well, it's a great question, and it's why I made the general point about SMEs in my introductory comment. But let me give you a couple of specific uh, further details. So first of all, it's in the interest of big, and uh, the industrial sector, although it has in it big companies, of course, represents everybody in the sector. So even in the drug, as you know, in the drug industry, there are dozens of small drug companies that lots of people haven't heard of. It's not just Glaxo and AstraZeneca. So there's plenty of diversity already in the sector itself. It's in the interest of the big companies to have a super vibrant supply chain. So the thing that's most important to me is to have lots of really good up and coming research companies creating innovation at the kind of bedrock. So we're very incented to do that. And one of the things you'll see in some of the strategies is a focus exactly on that because it's in the interest of everybody to have a vibrant supply chain, whatever that looks like. So that, that's there. The second thing I would say, and I'm just going to leap again into this review I'm doing, which does have, when you look at the strategy, there are all sorts of things which I think can be used to leverage this. So Heseltine report, there's a lot in there that can help. Uh, Lord Young's report on business schools, very valuable in this space. I'm focusing on the broader role of universities in in driving growth. One of the things I came across, the very first piece of evidence I took in that review in Newcastle was an accomplished entrepreneur, so an, a successful creator, sat in the room and said, Britain does not create entrepreneurs, it creates endurance entrepreneurs because it's so difficult, you have to be an endurance athlete to make it. Our job, government's job, is to take the word endurance out of that sentence. And what, there's all sorts of ways we can do that. We, we, Government funding is too fragmented, it's too complicated, it's too difficult to access at the very beginning. Business support is too fragmented and it's too, it too much depends on the SME knowing what it wants to know and where to go, when in fact they don't really know and they need more people leaning into them. We've got too much disaggregation across governments, you have to talk to too many departments to get something done. There's too little um, single government approach to tackle some of these things. Some of our benefits and incentives are too complex to understand. People say it's not worth it. It's not worth trying to access the incentives. It's too complicated. I don't want to hire another one person because it makes my life too difficult. Those sorts of things are the pieces we have to go really absolutely kind of forensically through and take out one by one by one. And it's going to be, it's going to be difficult, hard work. And unfortunately, it's a bit like in my company. Everybody in my company says, Andrew, can you simplify GSK, make it less complex? And I say, yes, as long as everybody in the room is prepared to give up one process that they currently own, because you all drive the complexity. Same answer to the SME question. How do we help SMEs? Government get more aligned about supporting SMEs. How do you do that? Take complexity out, which means some people are going to have to say, you know what, my thing isn't the most important thing. We're going to think about this from the customer end rather than from the government side and be much more focused on it that way. Lots of opportunity, and I think there's a lot of input coming from various sources, none of which will be individually perfect as a recommendation set, but I think government should, civil service should take a really clear-eyed view, a whole series of reports and reviews that you're getting, and you could put together a very interesting SME package, which could, I think could make a real different, uh, difference and give you a real agenda to work to over the next five or 10 years. Maybe time for one more question. 
If not, uh, thank you very much for your attention today and uh, appreciate you being interested in this. And if you do have the opportunity to help Biz uh, develop this agenda, I know the team there would be very grateful. Thanks very much.